Is it me you're looking for? <laughs> cool. Right, then um, can everybody now hear me? Has everybody had a good laugh at my expense? Because you're about to have some more. As uh, just introduced, this is going to cover off uh, quite a wide ar array of um, subjects. The first one is going to be me talking about myself, because I'm not amazing, but really just to establish uh, credibility and why I'm here today. This does mean there's a few embarrassing photos. Feel free to laugh. Um, and let's get started. Uh, now, I think if I press this, it should go into the next slide. Wonderful. So, who on earth am I? Just been introduced. My name is James Horstead. My Chinese name is Hui Ling Xiao. I am a current general manager of IND Legal Translation and Interpreting. Um, I am a member of the Chartered Institute of Linguists. Who's heard of the Chartered Institute of Linguists? Has anybody not heard of the Chartered Institute of Linguists? A couple. So the Chartered Institute of Linguists is a professional organization um, open to linguists. Uh, if you, anybody here is interested in a career as a linguist, an interpreter, or a translator, then you might want to look into it. Um, I'm also a chartered linguist at the Chartered Institute of Linguists. So clarification, you can be an associate member, a member, a fellow, but only if you meet certain criteria can you become a chartered linguist. And once you do, you get to put some nice, uh, nice letters next to your name. That's about it. Plus, you get some discounts on, uh, on various things once in a while. I sit, this one here, is the, uh, well, we call it Chinese speakers for short, because otherwise it's called the Association for Speakers of Chinese as a Second Language, and a long title is what you get when you let academics name things. <laughs> so, for those of you, is anybody here currently on an undergraduate course, or master's course, in Chinese language? Brilliant. Once you graduated, give them a look in. <laughs> so, for those that don't speak Chinese, uh, that says the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, uh, which means the next few slides are a journey of probably more than a thousand miles. I think one way to Beijing is about 5,000 miles, and I've been there a few times. Um, but by way of background, how on earth did I end up here? Why did I learn Chinese? Well, when I was probably slightly younger than you, you guys are, making a decision about what should I study at university, I was very much into martial arts. That's my father over there. He's not quite as stretchy or young anymore, but that, that's him then. Uh, he got me into stuff like that. And inevitably, at university, it was going to be karate or kung fu, Japanese or Chinese. And I don't like sushi. So Chinese it was. <laughs> uh, so I started a long time ago, not quite that long ago. That's not a, that's not real now. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, I started to study Chinese. Where do you think I started to study Chinese? Here. So you made a good choice if you study in here. It's bloody brilliant. It was wonderful. I'm going to rub it in for those that haven't had the year abroad yet. I managed to go on mine <laughs> because there wasn't a pandemic at the time. Sorry. <laughs> um, but if any of you, friends who are thinking about Leeds Uni, send them here. It's at this point, of course, when you're learning Chinese that you learn about something called translation. You don't just learn another language. You learn how to render that language in another one. For me, that's Chinese and English. But I wasn't very good at it at that point. So instead, I got a Saturday job teaching these rapscallions. I'm never doing it again. Good luck to any of you who want to be a teacher. If you are, be a teacher here so there's wonderful students. Not at primary school, one kid is enough. That was torture. <laughs> but I graduated. I was lucky. I managed to get a job six weeks out of uh, graduation. And I took it because... I needed the money, and because this job uh, allowed me to use Chinese. At the time, unfortunately, my father wasn't very well, so I stayed in the UK rather than going straight back to China. Um, and again, given the circumstances in the world at the moment, China's borders are still closed. If any of you are close to graduating and wanting to go back, there are jobs here that you can find using Chinese. Translation, interpreting be one of them, but there are others. Here, I was what was known as an overseas liaison officer, and essentially, I was uh, hired to translate. <laughs> um, initially, it was translating uh, school reports from kids. I saw the last slide. I still didn't manage to escape. 
Um, but this was at a guardianship company, so looking after students under the age of 18 who come from overseas to study in the UK. Uh, qu quickly, uh, responsibilities kind of cascaded. I ended up looking after about 400 students across um, 12 private um, boarding schools in the north of England. So you saw my last slide, and I said that was enough students. <laughs> I had a few more of them. Um, but it was wonderful. Eventually, I did manage to make my way back to China. Oh dear. <laughs> In my haste to go to China, I took a job that got me there, um, but I'm not gonna say how long ago this was, <laughs> um, but my starting wage was 8,000 US dollars a year. Mm -hmm. The deal was, after six months probation period and everything, it would double. I didn't get that far. I quit after three months. Uh, so, word of advice, if you're coming towards the end of um, study, make sure you're applying for jobs that you're going to like. <laughs> I disappeared from this job. Uh, my visa, and this is one of the features you can look at. <laughs> yeah, laugh at. I've put on a bit since then. Um, I suddenly found myself out of a very low paying job with sort of all to do except finding the job and a visa rapidly running out. So I did what any self-respecting person would do and took anything I could find. I started freelance translation. <laughs> uh, that picture I think was taken about two o'clock in the morning. I was translating a patent, a patent application for uh, some sort of chemical. Um, I, I tried to block it from my memory Never, ever will I translate anything to do with chemicals ever again. <laughs> and I, it took a while to do it. Uh, took, it was okay by the end of it, but there we go. Does trans freelance translation give you a visa? Not in China, at least. So I continued to do this, to pay the rent, and uh, at the same time, tried to look for another job to extend my visa, which I got. I joined the government. <laughs> Our government, not the Chinese one, I wasn't allowed to do that. <laughs> Too tall. Um, <laughs> I joined the British Consulate General in Shanghai. Aha, you're saying, but that picture's in Beijing. Yes, the training took part in Beijing um, at the main embassy. After I passed, which I did, we then went to Shanghai, which looked more like that. For context, that was a... Uh, colleague's 50th birthday. The work didn't look like that. I uh, joined what's known as the Hated Department, UKVI, Visas and Immigration. <laughs> um, as a, um, ooh, basically as a visa officer. Uh, it was a short-term contract, but of course I needed the visa, so I took it, and it was much better than $8,000 a year. <laughs> um, but short term. So I worked my socks off, being able to speak English, obviously English government, um, and Chinese was a massive advantage. Some of my uh, colleagues, they were sent over from Whitehall, from London. Uh, they tended not to be able to speak Chinese. I could. This meant I was faster than them. So I didn't need to try and leaf through all of the uh, translations. I could just read the original, uh, which meant my stats were better. And I got a reputation for being able to sniff out forged documents. That may have had something to do with the fact that as this contract was drawing to a close, I got offered a permanent position back up in Beijing. It's a good song. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it, but if anyone likes KTV, very good way of practicing your Chinese, especially with a couple of drinks. <laughs> and if you're Chinese, a little bit of round, a couple of drinks, practice your English, brilliant. Uh, it was a bigger team. I worked there in the same capacity for a short while, and then due to the aforementioned reasons, I eventually took over a department of 35 staff, local Chinese staff. Um, essentially, it was the forgery detection unit. It was immensely fun. <laughs> I then managed to work my way out of the hated department across to the just slightly disgruntled department, which was uh, the political department. And that meant I could use my language skills uh, in a few more contexts. Um, it's me talking the Jinan government, 
that's uh, I think that was in Shenzhen, the one at the top right. Top left is speaking with the ambassador, who is now our representative to the UN. So you might have seen her in the news recently due to what's going on. And uh, I, uh, I met my wife there. <laughs> so I gained quite a bit. However, the time came to eventually move back to the UK. Why? Well, the smog in Beijing at the time wasn't brilliant, not good for big lungs. Uh, oh, I'll come back to that one. Never mind little lungs. So we moved back because my wife was expecting. That one, I mentioned earlier I was heavily into martial arts. That's what kind of got me into learning Chinese. Never gave it up until I came back to the UK. No laughing. Um, but if any of you who are learning Chinese uh, and find yourself in China, um, pick up an unusual hobby, speak about it in Chinese, you'll end up on the news like I did. <laughs> so move back to uh, the UK. That's, that's a very grumpy me, that small one. That, that one there. And my father. And that's me and my son. That's a little uh, couple of years ago, I think that's. Um, so we moved back. I left the government. And I joined the private sector. Now we get to the interesting bit. This is about language, uh, language services. Uh, I left the FCL, or FCDL, I think it's now called, and joined a company called The Big Word. Has anybody heard of The Big Word? Can anybody guess what The Big Word might be? Yes, it's not a trick question. It's, it was a translation company. It is a translation company. It's based out of Leeds, um, although they have offices around the uh, around the world um, and it is one of the global top 20 LSPs language service providers it's pretty big I started out in middle management worked my way up ended up looking after the greater China area and our China office which is based in Beijing but I did it from here <laughs> uh, and then eventually took another role uh, which is where I am now at IMD Briefly onto this slide, I never gave up doing a bit of freelance, never gave up what I would call establishing credibility. And for any of you that are taking a job in anything, establishing credibility will help, no matter, no matter what it is you're working on. For me, it was writing a few articles for uh, various industry magazines and, of course, continuing to do some translation. I joined there. And that's my background. Any questions on the embarrassing photos or personal stories before we move on? I said I wanted this interactive. Please do make it. If you have any questions at any point, stick your hand up. I'm happy to answer as we go along. Otherwise, hopefully, there'll be quite a bit of time at the end to, uh, to grill me and put me under interrogation. James. Yes. Uh, yes, at the end, I'll invite you all, if you have any questions or want to talk to me later, add me on LinkedIn. There's variants of those um, articles through there. Uh, those two particular articles were published in The Linguist magazine, uh, which is uh, run by the Chartered Institute of Linguists. Um, so I think you can, if you go online, some of the back editions are available free to, free to read. Uh, at least one of them probably is now free to read because it was a while ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, please do on there. What's this all taught me? It's better to win the lottery. <laughs> Unfortunately, none of us uh, tend to be that lucky. So I'm hoping over the next however many slides, and then at the Q&A at the end, you guys can extract from me as much information as, as you can get. And I hope it will be useful uh, to you all, both as, as students, after you've graduated, just in general, but also specifically if you're looking to make use of your language skills, particularly in the language industry. A few words. Most of it's going to be pictures. Uh, that's in case anybody wants to take a snapshot of it or if it prompts any questions. But what on earth is the language service industry? It's big. It's not monopolized. There are literally thousands of players across the world. Why? Why isn't one company in charge of it all? Can anybody hazard a guess? Put it. 
Correct. Uh, my follow-up question was going to be, how many languages are there in the world? And then how many language pairs? Which means, if you want to break into the language industry, it's a chance. Not as easy as that, we'll get onto it. But it's big, it's massive. Um, there's no real big players that you have to sign up with. There's large players, but there's no one really controlling it all, like Sainsbury's or something, Tesco's. <laughs> and interestingly, um, one thing that I'm going to suggest to people if they are wanting to become linguists is to make sure that you're a member of a national association. It adds credibility. It opens up CDP opportunities, so, um, continuing professional development opportunities, which I'll speak on again later. Um, but also, a lot of uh, LSPs, some are, some aren't members of it. Join the ones that are members, because they get a bit more work, they've got a bit more credibility, and they pay better rates. Uh, interestingly, according to the um, ILA uh, 2022 report, most of the most of language service requirements tend to go through Europe than America. But I'm going to caveat that with it was a survey carried out in Europe and America. So. <laughs> Take that one with a pinch of salt. Also, if I imagine most people here, their language pairs are, are Chinese or traditional simplified oral Chinese language and English. Uh, so, big market there. But if you have a rarer language, uh, then you can probably charge a bit more there as well. <laughs> uh, interestingly, we had a requirement for a lang language called the uh, Sichuela. Creole. My French accent is terrible. Seychelles Creole. It turns out there's about four linguists in the world. We managed to engage them. So we're really good. But my point is, it's a niche. We'll get more into that later as well. If you are looking at seriously starting a career or continuing a career in language services, then you probably have noticed the rates in general tend not to be brilliant. Linguists always complain about them. Everybody always complains about them. They've been stagnant for quite a while. And this is taken from the same report, by the way. Uh, I'm sure if you ask nicely after this, uh, the slides will be shared. And there's a few notes in there which will point you in the direction of the report. Um, has anybody here... Has anybody here, at, until this point, actually taken on a language service commission? Have you acted as an interpreter or a translator in a professional context? By that I mean, have you been paid for it? Anybody? Got one hand going up here. Come on, don't be shy. Two, uh, yeah, three. Ah, come on, come on, it's good. <laughs> um, right, the people four people, I think, put their hands up. Is anybody going to be brave enough to tell me about that experience? If, has it happened once? Have you done it a couple of times? You're looking at me so I don't think of me. <laughs> uh, I was working with someone Japanese and English. Ah, so that's Nick. How, how did you find that job? My an older student told me about Tango, mm -hmm. which is a platform, and then I got into that, and then applied and I passed the test. Ah, you applied and you passed the test. Tell me more about a test. They had a small translation test, uh -huh. so they did a really more of a source test in Japanese about the round the clock of the first article. Unusual, but okay. <laughs> It does, but I'm going to have some follow-up ones. <laughs> um, wh when was this, just for context? Um, okay, so a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. -ish. Okay, in that case, things probably haven't changed too much. You're thinking, ooh, pandemic, things have changed. Not so much. The, uh, this industry is a good one for working from home. <laughs> and you'll notice when crises happen, talking about the industry at a, of a 
as a whole, not necessarily individual language pairs, but an industry as a whole tends to adapt quite well. Um, at the time, I was still working at Big Word uh, when this all went, you know, pandemic all blew up. Within a week, we were all working from home. And uh, by the time I'd left there, 98% of all employees in the UK had had their contracts changed to permanently work from home. So there's resilience in this industry, but rates seem to have been stagnant for quite a while. What this doesn't take into account, however, for if you're all going, oh crap, I'm in the wrong lecture, I don't want to do this anymore, no one's going to do me. This doesn't take into account the usage of technology to increase productivity, and this just takes into account rates, not profitability. That's the point I'm going to make here. Rates, everybody complains about. Yeah, sometimes they're not ideal. Depends how you've positioned yourself and what your specialism is. But rates and profitability, although linked, are two different things. And you have control over profitability. What does MTPE mean? Can somebody hazard a guess what I mean by MTPE? Or if I take the... Yay! <laughs> Someone going to tell me what that is? Both of them. They're linked. What are they? Okay. Has anybody done this before? Has anybody stuck something through a machine, remove the translate, and then try to fix it on the way out? A couple of people are going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did you find it? Did anybody like it? Did anybody hate it? <laughs> now, why does it say threat or opportunity? Often linguists see machines as taking over the world. They probably will. We'll all die. We've seen Terminator. But it's also seen as an opportunity by LSPs. Why? Well, because they don't have to pay linguists as much, and they can pump through massive volumes of stuff. Um, this graph here, by the way, is, uh, is looking at um, where LSPs are planning on growing and where things are at the moment. So the blue line is what they're interested in investing in, and red, uh, red lines are where things are at the moment. Hmm. Yeah. They're looking a lot at it. Why? Well, it's profitable. That means they're going to force it on us. Oh, no. Are we scared? Slightly. Why? Well, if I was editing, it's not necessarily a bad thing, depending on your language pair, specialism, what it's being used for. Okay. If it's uh, English into Polish, and it's on a technical manual, you know, like uh, insert A into B, and then you've got a chair or something, it actually works quite well, because the grammar's simple, the instructions. It didn't go too far wrong. In the post editing, it can be brushed up nice and neat. What do you think will happen if somebody tried to translate war and peace from Russian to Chinese using a machine? <laughs> exactly. So, why is it sometimes viewed as a threat? Well, because depending on your language pair and specialism, the output could be crap. Not going to lie, English Chinese got better over the last couple of years, but it's still, in my opinion, uh, in my experience, got a little way to go. Um, I guess if it was a, a technical manual, then you can probably do it, but you'd probably just be able to do it as quick translating it yourself. The difference is the LSP will pay you less for the post-editing, about 30% less. Note that, because uh, some LSPs will try and negotiate a bit more. I'd say 30, 25%, 30 is, is, is average. But if somebody approaches you and asks if you're willing to do it, ask to see the text first and then make your own mind up. Opportunity, it is. It's getting better, certainly neural machine translation over the last five years. It will continue to get better. It is something that we're going to have to learn to live with. Make sure you know what machines are best in your language pairs and specialisms. There's loads out there. Amazon's got one now, Google, Microsoft, uh, Systrans, um, DeepL or DeepL. Seen some people nodding, so you've heard of this. Good. The reason I mention it here is because it 
if you go into the big wide world as a linguist, as a translator, you'll see it. Don't avoid it. Challenges, again, all of this is taken from the Ellis 2022 report. Yeah, I remember what I was supposed to do at university. I got my reference in there. Um, that one over there uh, are the concerns and challenges from LSPs. This one over here is uh, from individual linguists. You'll see rates at the bottom and price pressure. We mentioned this a couple of slides ago. Everybody's talking about it. Everyone's concerned about it. Why? Well, because nobody wants to pay anything. They always want it yesterday, and they want it perfect. That will always be there. Again, make sure you know your market rate and your language pair and your specialism. I keep saying specialism. I will come back to this. It's key. Does anybody have any questions of anything up until this point? Please write them down and keep them to the end if you'd like to. Otherwise, I will occasionally ask this question, and everybody will go. Any questions? Cool, then I will continue. How many people here are students? Do you have challenges? Not those sort of challenges. Right. <laughs> Uh, again, taken from the same report, um, this bottom one is uh, hopefully something that I will be able to not completely address, but perhaps lend some of my experience to. Um, think of these things. Is this true reflection? If you have any questions on them, make a note now or ask now. I'll leave that up for five more seconds. Any questions on this? I'm presuming everybody knows the difference between the two. A translator is written, interpreter is spoken. Who here wants to become one of these? It's, this is not a trick question. This is, it's good. I, I do this. This is it's not a bad career, <laughs> despite the fact of some of the things that I've said. Good. So we've got some people there. Um, of those that put their hands up, do you have a particular persuasion? Would you prefer to be a translator or an interpreter? A translator? That is a very fair point, and I will touch upon um, some of those stresses uh, a bit later. I'm not going to lie to anybody. Interpreting can be stressful, certainly in a legal context. Uh, but we'll get into that shortly. I, you'll notice. Um, when I was introduced, I'm a chartered linguist in two categories, a uh, language specialist. Basically, what that means is in my working day, I use my working pairs, not necessarily as a translator or as an interpreter, but just in the general course of business. Second one was as a translator. I didn't say interpreter. I'm not that good. <laughs> if you want to become an interpreter, well done. That is quite a difficult thing, in my opinion, to do. I've got a terrible short-term and long-term memory, which is why I can't do it. Um, we'll get on to interpreting shortly. Well, now, in fact. Uh, another question. This is going to bring it into le a legal context. What does it involve? What, what might you be interpreting if it's in a legal context? Let's have some answers shout about. What, what could I possibly be interpreting in a legal context? Crimes, yep. Probate, yep. Contracts, yes. Wills, yes. It is good. Anything else? Patents, yes, yeah. I remember I did that one many years ago. <laughs> yes, some shocked faces here. Why, why might you have to translate or interpret anything in a legal context. What? Hmm? Go on. Oh, it could be a bad end Yes, that's what I said. But why? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah, no. Uh, if you're going to become a interpreter in particular um, and specialize in the, the narrow, massive field that is legal, whatever the hell that is, you could be interpreting on absolute the anything. It could be a patent about one of these things. It could be a patent about one of these things. It could be a patent about a bloody chemical. 
In general, though, you'll find most things are squished and squashed into one of these. Um, and that's what most often IMD Google Translation deals with. If anyone has any questions, again, shout out or uh, make note and we can do it at the end. Um, but yeah, no, in effect, anything. This gentleman was a uh, senior course interpreter in Hong Kong, uh, both before and after the handover. Uh, you might have heard of him, Jackie Mao. He owns a, um, an LSP at, at Hong Kong now. Uh, but what he said, uh, and it's only in English because he only said it in English, <laughs> um, he got to know everything. That's why I said I'm not one. Much as I pretend to think I know everything, I don't. Now, if you're interpreting, I mean, this goes for translating as well, but much more for um, interpreting, you need to do it correctly. What, what, what's interpreting correctly? What, what might I possibly mean by interpreting correctly? Yes, no, correct. Um, to an extent. If I am interpreting between two people and uh, perhaps it's a business meeting that's got very heated. Two, pe two people sitting or negotiating over a contract. And one of them goes, no, we're not paying that. As an interpreter, do I go, no, I'm not paying that. <laughs> yes, someone's saying yes, yes. No. <laughs> um, one should be in impartial. Uh, these two people are sitting next to each other. They can see what they're doing. Um, but it's open to interpretation. I'm not going to make you read through all of these, nor am I going to read them all out. It'll be up there for a second, and then I'll go on to the next one. But what does it mean? These are several questions around it. Perhaps some, uh, some of you might want to ask these questions later. So I'll shut up for about five seconds, and we'll have a look. Does anybody want to explore any of these now or later? Uh, a law degree would be extremely helpful. <laughs> um, yes, yes, it would, uh, but more than a basic understanding. Um, so for the company which I currently manage, uh, we, we have quite a high uh, standard for our linguists. Uh, first of all, they should meet all of the minimum criteria of being IS, uh, ISO 17100 compliant. What's ISO 17100? What's an ISO? What is ISO? What does that stand for? Yes. So, um, but basically, they come up with standards for everything. Everything. We're ISO 17100 and 9001 certified. 17100 is specifically around translation. Now, in that, to become certified, um, it outlines qualifications requirements for anyone that's involved at any one point of it. So, that's a basis that we use for all of our employees and linguists, and then on top of that, we look for linguists in particular that have certain skill. For example, they are lawyers or doctors. Uh, if you have no understanding of, of law, would it be a good idea to pretend, well, pretend to be an interpreter and turn up in court? Why? What might go wrong? you'll misinterpret something, and somebody will end up 20 years in prison. And later, that might be you for doing that. <laughs> so this, again, uh, after the slides, we'll, we'll share with you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly over this one, because I'm very keen to have more of a discussion. Um, but essentially, if you're being an interpreter, how can you make things good for yourself? First of all, make sure you've got at least a basic understanding of what it is that you're about to interpret. Otherwise, uh, these things here. So make sure everyone's clear on your role. Make sure you're clear on what it is that you're going to be interpreting. If this is an assignment from an LSP, for example, ask them for a bit of background. And then I'll go on to the next slide. Be confident. Definitely be confident. 
One thing that I've seen a few times, uh, certainly with people new into the profession, is that they're, they're not confident. Colonel Gaddafi, remember him? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it was him anyway. His uh, interpreter died on the job because the uh, good old colonel just went on and on and on and didn't let him have a break. Insist on breaks. Uh -huh. um, if you can't hear something, you know, just say. Usually it's not going to piss people off because they'd rather things be interpreted properly. And of course, your reputation also depends on it. So, why be confident? You don't get it wrong. Here's an example. What for the Chinese speakers amongst us is potentially wrong in this context with this word. <laughs> what should it be? Anybody has it a guess? Why, why is this wrong and what, what would a better word to be used be? Because the, so for non-Chinese speakers, that first one, it did say drugs, but the fun type, the fun type. <laughs> Whereas uh, what it should be is drugs, see where the ambiguity is, but drugs as in uh, medicine. Why be confident so you don't get it wrong? Take your time, think about it. The people are talking too fast and asking to slow down. But make sure before any of this happens, you've clarified what your purpose is and how it's going to go. Own it. Bit of a funny translator, interpreter. What's the difference? What do they do? Which ones do you want to become? How do you do it? I hope nobody here is wanting to become a linguist for the money and the fame. A couple of linguists admittedly do become relatively famous, but like artists, it tends to be a while after. <laughs> um, how, as newly qualified linguists, might you, might you get a, a job? Freelance linguist. Who's me? How? Sign up with an ISP. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. If you're signing up, you need a CV. That's an example of a CV. Um, a few people have gone, <gasps> yeah. That's my reaction when something like this drops onto, uh, onto my desk as well. How am I going to really spend 10 minutes reading through all of this to find out now? What do you think I need to see if a linguist wants to sign up with me? What bits of information are important for me as an LSP? Qualifications, I hear someone whispering. Yep, qualifications, yes. Experience. Experience, yep. What language Definitely. What profession are you in? Ah, someone's done this before. Credibility. Yes, now you can see quite clearly he's trying to establish that. But he's done it in a messy way. I mean, I've, I've anonymized these, but it is uh, otherwise a, a live example. Um, the linguist uh, themselves is actually quite good. They've just got a crap CV. Is this one better, worse, the same? It's a bit wordy, but it is marginally better. Why? Well, because they've given clearly their rates across the different uh, work streams. Very obvious is their language pairs. Um, contact details are on there, qualifications. They've got a nice summary. The summary is the bit that I'll be looking at. Has anybody here tried to put together a CV before? Has anybody here tried to put together a CV particularly for the language industry? A few shaking of heads. Take this on board then, because as a freelancer, you're not one, well, you might want a permanent job, but they're not going to give you one. Um, you're, you're trying to establish with them credibility. You can do the work, and you want them to give it to you. An LSP usually gets quite a few of these every month, week, day, 
certainly the large, larger ones, uh, and it's some poor sod's job to go through it and say, yeah, okay, we'll probably talk to this one. We'll increase your chances, make sure it's relevant. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay. Spend a couple of minutes, read this, and then I'm going to ask you what an LSP um, might have more questions about, what might they like, what might they not like. This, again, has been taken as a live example uh, from a linguist CV. Pay attention to this, not to this, we'll get to it. <laughs> uh, between, between a group, so, yeah. You're not allowed to ask him, that's cheating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, they found me. So the question, sorry, I've been asked to repeat the question. So the question is, spend a minute or so reading this and think, what might an LSP, a language service provider who's seen this on a CV, think? What might they find is useful? What might they find not useful? What's good, what's bad? Stop looking at the CVs that have just been put on your table. That's next. <laughs> Feel free to discuss amongst yourselves, but if somebody has something and they think that's particularly good, bad, or that they want to question, we're at school, so stick up your hand and I'll, uh, I'll point you out. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah, no, th this is part of a CV, it's at the end, it is the bit that's to do with money. few good ideas in the right direction. Anybody want to take the first leap and make a suggestion? This isn't graded, by the way. I'm not a lecturer here, so I'm just... <laughs> So readability is one. It, it could be, you're right, it could make it stand out slightly more. For context, this is the last little bit on somebody's two-page CV. That's the T's and C's at the bottom. The rest of the, um, the CV was standard acceptable, say. But this is the bit that we're concentrating on. So readability is potentially one. What else? What's jumping out at you? What's, what information is it saying? What question might you have around it? So can I can I extrapolate from that you've read it and gone, hmm?
I'm going to ask a couple of questions to make sure we all understand the content, and then we're going to go back to this, so keep thinking about it. First of all, has everybody heard of cat tours? What's a cat tour? Everybody <laughs> Has everybody used a cat tour? Does anybody have a favorite? <laughs> so everybody have a uh, one that they'll put up with that isn't quite as bad as the rest of them? <laughs> cat tools are widely used, as you probably know, across the industry. Computer aided translation, the idea is uh, on one side you've got your um, your source text, and then you can look at it while typing in your uh, your translation. You can upload glossaries. You can upload well nowadays. I think you can probably do it with a machine translation as well. But glossaries, um, translation memories. Uh, the idea behind them, of course, is to uh, make your job easier or pay you less, um, <laughs> because often word counts, which is mentioned in here. I think word counts are weighted. On a cat tour, as you're going through, you may see that, and I, I know that several people probably are quite familiar with this, but for those that aren't, as you go through in the bit where you're translating into, if it's been translated before and is held in the translation memory, it'll pop up and say, hey, did you mean this? And there'll be a percentage next to it. So it'd be 100% the same, or 75% the same, or a word is the same. <laughs> and on those percentage bandings, an LSP would usually pay you accordingly. So if it's a 0% match, there's nothing there, it's all a new word, then you get paid your per word rate. If it's a 100% match, then you might not get paid anything for that particular segment or a percentage of your word rate. What that percentage is, it depends between the LSP, the project, and, and the client and whatnot. But it is often seen in the industry, especially amongst larger LSPs. Invoicing. Everyone knows what invoicing is, right? Invoicing is, uh, I did some work for you. Here is my charge. Please pay me. If you don't know that, you really need to know it because you need to get paid. Um, So I'm back to my original question now that we've clarified those things. What's standing out here? We've had, it's a bit jarring. It's more of a, ooh, take it or leave it, but somebody's applying for a job. I got it correct. <laughs> but if you phrase things like this, honestly, you're not going to get much work from this LSP. Why? Why? Apart from it being jarring and just off-putting, what? Why? what things are going to put off an LSP working with you. Would you work with this person? No. So services on a project for project basis, yep, that's pretty standard, fine. Estimates, okay, fine. Because everyone needs to know your rate. You can potentially negotiate around it. Minimum charge of two hours, fine. However, we start to get problems really on the second paragraph. Moved away from the per word pricing model. That is an industry standard. <laughs> That's what most will pay you on. Already this person's limiting themselves something massively. So unless they already have a group of direct clients that can sustain their work, this is a bit dangerous for them. No word count leveraging. Linguists don't like it because if you, somebody says, oh, we've got a 10,000 um, word project for you, okay? And then you get it and you look at it and there's, there's one new word and the rest are all from the translation memory. And instead of uh, being paid a thousand pounds, you're getting a tenner. So this is why I said at the beginning, back to the interpreter example, make sure you know what you're getting into, make sure everything's clarified from the beginning as there are surprises. But no word count leveraging. If it's working with a larger or even a medium sized LSP, you're probably going to come up against it. So you're, you're doing yourself out of some work. That's fine if you don't want to do that work and you can survive otherwise, but it happens a lot. TMX and TBX files um, not provided to, unless with a charge. Uh, you're rubbing someone up the wrong way that way because it doesn't take much to, to create one. Uh, it's down to them, but 
like you just said. It's a bit jarring, but mm. um, invoices issue release quite possibly that's fair enough. However, fifteen days of invoice. Is that good, bad, average, more or less? What, what would somebody say if I said, okay, you've done the work for me, I'm going to pay you in 15 days' time? Yep, that's fine. What if I said, I'm going to pay you in three months' time? What if I said I was going to pay you in 30 days' time? Nodding at 30 days, no for three months, 15, yes. Everyone wants to be paid quick. Standard, industry standard, Everywhere I've worked or interacted with is 30 days. Why? Because, honestly, if it's a business you're dealing with, it fits better into their accounting systems. So if there's a choice of several linguists, this one's going to cost me probably more because it's per hour, and they want paying quicker than everybody else, am I going to use this linguist or that? The reason I'm putting this here and spending so much time on it is if you are wanting to become a linguist, then you're going to have to have discussions around these things. I want you to be confident and to know your worth, know your niche, know your market rate, but understand what your clients are looking for as well. Negotiation is settling somewhere halfway. But if you know the standards, 30-day payment terms, and the, the rates are okay if that would be a per word rate, but... Uh, that's what you can negotiate, I guess. Any questions on this? Have you all had a quick sneaky peek at the uh, CVs in front of you? Then have a quick sneaky peek. <laughs> Not going to spend very much time on this one because we've, um, we've had a, a little bit of a look. This really is just to give you a closer look at the examples that we've had up there. <laughs> There's, uh, there's three examples. Um, I'm not necessarily going to say they're all good or all bad. Some, they have good and bad points on them. Okay, now you've all had a very quick look at possibly one of them. I'm now going to give you 20 seconds to pick out on any of them whether somebody's qualified, what their rates are, and whether you'd want to work with them. Just three things. Are they qualified for you to work with? Are they affordable enough for you to work with? Will you work with, the, with that CV? Would you work with them? Okay, has everybody had chance? I know that's pretty quick, but has everybody had chance to decide who they want to work with? That's about as much time as someone's going to spend on your CV. Are you all still reading them? <laughs> There's a lot to read there. Uh, some of it's superfluous, some of it could be useful, it could be worth going back to. Um, essentially, they've all got on there their qualifications, their experience, they don't all have their rates on, that's fine. Um, they're all qualified linguists, they're all examples taken from real linguists, uh, anonymized of course, I don't know anybody called your blogs. Um, but there's a lot of words on each of them, isn't there? When you're putting together your CVs, qualification, experience, specialism, and if you want, you can put your rates on. That's all they're looking for. And when you're looking at your experience, you don't need to go into detail about how you were a barmaid in Spain during your summer holiday in the middle of uni. Um, what they're wanting is the experience that's related to your specialism. And if you're starting out, fine, put a quick line on it, but if you've got something relevant, make sure it's relevant and easily findable and readable. I'm not saying this is a perfect example. There's me. <laughs> One page. Um, this was very quickly put together, so it's, it's definitely not a perfect example, but I think it is trying to illustrate the point there that I've got my language pairs, 
with my skills, so I can do uh, translation, transcreation, I don't do interpreting. Collaborating, communicating, and delivering at pace. Why are they on there? Because everybody wants the translation yesterday, and they need to talk to you about it. Communication is very important in anything you do. Make sure you're clear in your communication, talking, or email. And in terms of translation and interpreting assignments, you need to know when the, what the TAT is, TAT, turnaround time, what uh, the word count is, actual word count, weighted or otherwise, what the rate is you're going to get paid, and whether or not you can actually do it. Is it your specialism? Um, qualification, there's a few on there. Um, specialisms, uh, well, law, legal, and contracts, I kind of have to put in there now. <laughs> um, words translated, people like to see it, but it's absolutely useless. Have I translated five million words? Maybe. I've not counted them all. <laughs> it's your experience, your qualifications that they're in. You'll notice that I've not put on there rates. Why have I not put rates on there? Yes. If I'm working with a small agency in um, Jiangxi, compared to a very large agency in um, Bucharest, another country and city, are they going to be sending me the same types of projects with the same types of rates? No. This is kind of dangerous. A live example. A couple of weeks ago, I was approached, and I was asked to do what was equivalent about four hours' work for the yeah, Ambai Choir. Did I accept that job? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, that's the below living wage here. And you, you will come across that, because people will be asking you from different locations, and the, the amounts that they can offer differ. But that's why I've not put my rates on there. If it's an easy job, it's a fiver, and I can do it in 10 minutes, yeah, yeah fine. If it's a hard job, and it's a fiver, and I can do it in five hours, mm -hmm, no. Each is a bit more unique. And what you may find is that you're negotiating different rates with different agencies, certainly at the beginning of your career. Once you've got a bit more experience behind you, you can say, no, these are my rates, take it or leave it. And you can back that up with your qualifications and experience. For example, um, if we have a medical document at the company uh, which I manage at the minute, we've got a medical document that needs translating from English to Polish. We've got a very good linguist who's a qualified doctor and a qualified linguist. If it's going to be used in a court case, as long as the end client is happy with the, the pricing, you'll use him. He's a bit more expensive but it'll be perfect. If they're not so happy with the pricing, we have other experts that have experience, but they're not qualified doctors. They've just spent 20 years translating medical documents. But you can see you pay more, you get more, but most people don't want to pay anything. Therefore, if you overprice yourself, you're not going to, you're not going to make it. Um, he still works as a doctor as well, so he is definitely okay for his income. <laughs> Cool. Um, just an example, but it's one page, and that's what I'm trying to get across to you. No need to go overboard. Recap, big, big industry. Um, you're going to have to find a niche, because if you just do generic stuff, yeah, there's work there, but it's the low-paid stuff. Specialize in something. That could be contract. It could be medical documents. It could be kung fu novels. I'm happy to do that. Um, so think about your niche now. Think about your specialism now while you're studying and try and do it. Take on some work. Register. Hmm? Because if you wait until you've graduated and then you start, it's going to take you that amount of time again to establish credibility and to get your foot through the door. If you've got a little bit of coming through, then you're constantly practicing. It doesn't have to be something highly specialized at this point. It's just to get you practicing. CPD. Continual professional development, very important, never stop it, but it doesn't mean learning the new CAT tool. It could be, but we mentioned machine translation. A lot of linguists fear it because they don't want to learn about it. Learn about it. Professional development isn't the stuff that you like to learn or that you want to learn more from. It's what you need to learn and what you need to do. If you're not confident picking up a phone and ringing and saying, hey, can I register with you? Pick up a phone and ring somebody and say, yeah, can I register with you? Most people won't shout at you. Some will. Not going to lie. 
But you need that resilience and you need to practice. Otherwise, nobody's going to send you any work. Communicate well, both on the phone when you're saying, please can I register you with you, please? Um, and then when you're following up with your CV, we've just gone through some examples which hopefully illustrate that. that. Same as when, you, uh, when you're typing in an email, keep it concise to the point, make sure the information is laid out simply. And be confident. Whether you're working for a business, whether you're working for yourself, your biggest unique selling point is you. No matter what your niche is, within your niche, you are still your unique selling point. There's only one of you. Tell the world about it. These we've touched on. I'll just leave them up there um, for a second. Um, market yourself, I'm going to touch upon a little bit more. Have you all heard of pros.com? Hmm? It's becoming a bit of a dinosaur now. I was worried everyone was going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a website which a lot of linguists have registered on, a lot of LSPs have registered on. It was pretty big about 50 years ago. <laughs> um, maybe not quite that long ago. It still exists. Get on it, you know. It's, it, it does look a bit dated. Uh, P-R-O-Z.com. Have you all heard of LinkedIn? I'm afraid for at least half the audience, if you move back to China, you might need a VPN to get to it now because it's changed recently. But if you're working with clients outside of China, and even some with larger firms or LSPs within China, it's still a useful platform to be on. And start that now as well. Because if you've got five connections, and you're saying, can I have a job, please? And somebody checks you on LinkedIn and goes, oh, five connections. This linguist's got 50,000 and lots of uh, recommendations. You get where I'm going. Get on it now. Ask for recommendations. Ask for endorsements by friends. It builds up a bit of credibility. Because when the manager's looking at your CV, uh, OK, they'll do a quick open source check. Have you got your own website? You don't have to have one. But if you do, and it you know, looks nice, credibility. If you've got a LinkedIn profile or you've got several recommendations or endorsements, huh, okay, bit of credibility. This person exists, they're doing what they say they're doing, okay, we'll let them on our system. Uh, networking in person, no one's done it for a couple of years. Um, I would argue that it's probably less of a priority. It's nice, it's nice to talk to people, but our language pairs are on the other sides of the world. The internet's a wonderful platform. Has anybody heard of the 80-20 rule? A few people, so basically the, the concept is that 20% of what you're spending your time on gives you 80% of your results. Put that into practice with everything that you're doing. I did with the ice cream. That's why 80% of the work came from. <laughs> right, that's the end of it. I'm going to leave this up for a few, um, a few moments, and then I'm going to put on the last slide, which has a QR code um, for the Confucius Institute for you to give any feedback. This I'm going to leave uh, on here. My address is there. I am on LinkedIn. I'm happy to, um, to connect, and if anybody has questions later or that they think of down the line, ping me a message. I'm happy to discuss or answer them. But now that brings us on to the interrogation. I mean, the question and answers um, part. So for this, I'm going to move around here because I'm, I'm not a lecturer. I do feel like a teacher at the minute. I'm not. I'm going to come around here, and then we can all talk nicely. So anybody wants my name or to add me quickly, quickly, quickly? James Holstead is the full name. And we'll go into the conversation. I have no idea what the questions are, but if they ask if I'm good or bad, then please give honest feedback, but say I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. So you talked about the qualifications and what you said. If you want to get sending messages across your CV, definitely get the personal information. Um, did you say work in China? So you said what you did before. Mm -hmm. And in China, is there any other qualifications in between? I'm actually worried about the 
Yes, I have. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, YouTube Ignition in China in Oklahoma. Um, I'm not sure, do people value it here? Is uh, they do if they understand it. Now, uh, if you're applying to an LSP, then the hope is that they will understand it because a lot of different jurisdictions, companies, they have something similar. It's not the same across everywhere. In the UK, um, the language service industry is unregulated. This is why I recommend that if you were going to do it in the UK that you register with perhaps CIOL, so the Chartered Institute of Linguists, or um, the Association uh, of Translation Companies, if you're a company, if you set up your own company, or, uh, or, or similar. There's uh, three or four that are quite good in the, in the UK. Um, if you go back to China, but you're applying for uh, jobs from an LSP in, in the UK, make sure you point it out. Don't, don't write catty, write the entire thing out. Uh, there's the same in the Middle East, um, I can't remember the, uh, the acronym, but essentially it's for Arab translators, Arabic tr uh, translators. Um, so, yes. Now, the caveat that I'm going to put here is on the ISO 17100. That doesn't necessarily say that that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's open to interpretation, which is why I'm highlighting it here. It's the three criteria, basically, under ISO 17100 to be a um, compliant linguist. One is five years full-time work experience as a linguist. The second is a degree in anything and two years full-time experience as a linguist. And the third one is a degree, so an undergraduate or a master's or equivalent at that level from a HEI, a higher educational institution um, in translation and then interpreting. You don't need the full-time experience there. So if any of you are um, studying, be that the undergraduate or the master's, and it's heavily involved in translation or actually called translation, that's the best thing, uh, then that would tick that off and then you're compliant. Um, not all LSPs necessarily require it, but a lot and a growing number of them are trying to get that certification. So it's highly recommended. In the UK, as an individual, so that's that certification for a company. In the UK, there is a, and one association, it's um, the, associate, uh, the Association of Translation and Interpreters, uh, ATI. Um, through them, if you join them, there is an option for you individually as a linguist to become ISO 17100 compliant. Um, I mean, you've got to pay for the privilege because they give you a nice certificate, but, <laughs> but um, it's a nice to have. Yes, yeah, so the Association of uh, Interpret... Is it AIT or ATI? Which way around is it? Thank you. <laughs> it's, that's it. Um, you can tell that I'm not a member with them. I'm a member with the CIOL. <laughs> so... Quick answer to your question. Yes, um, it's brilliant to have that. Use the long form when you're sticking it on your CV and mentioning it. Uh, and yes, definitely include that as a qualification. Oh, there's going to be more than one. Um, can you talk about, no. if you've got over the experience, um, differences between working for an LSP in the UK and versus China? Yeah, the language. <laughs> 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 Um, no, I can't. Um, I can go on further and say Taiwan as well. Yeah. So that I'm mentioning Taiwan because politics aside, it's a slightly different jurisdiction, so there's slightly different habits, and of course it's in traditional Chinese. But yeah, the fundamental difference is the language. They're all LSPs. They're all going to give you work in a very similar way. They usually work through a sort of um, a TMS, a translation management system, which essentially is a CAT tool, usually online. Um, sometimes they don't. Sometimes, like here, any LSP might just send you a file, and a, a style guide or whatnot. But if you're working through an LSP, oftentimes it will be through a, uh, a TMS or an ILS, Interpreting Management System. Um, differences primarily around rates, turnaround times. Um, and that would be the same for any of you that go back to China and then work for an LSP in the UK because they'll obviously do things based on GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, UK Time. The way around, it's always on, on China Time. Um, rates, would, rates would be the other thing. 
and that's harkening back to what I said earlier about the different standards of, of rates of um, living wages uh, or minimum wages in those different jurisdictions. The example that I said earlier was 200 RMB. That's obviously coming from uh, from maybe from from inside China. Um, but if you're asking in terms of interaction with project managers, then mm, go on. Well, you could, uh, you could work in China and do something for an OSP in the UK. The one thing that I'll point out here, though, is tax purposes. <laughs> um, it could get a bit uh, convoluted, shall I say, if you are living full-time in China and all of your work comes from the UK. If HMRC finds out about it, then they'll be wanting to tax you. Um, so I would... Taking part of your work from there is fine. Nobody really going to look into it unless you're doing all of your work there. I'm not encouraging anybody to break the law. Of course, I'm going to caveat this, and I need to, because legal translation, caveat it well, by saying make sure you look into the relevant laws because they do differ depending on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a nice idea to go and live in Bali for six months and do all your translation from there. But if you've got there on a tourist visa and you're working full time, they find out, they might take issue with that. Uh, does, does that answer that part of the question? Are you sure? Yeah. No, 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 you've got some more. I mean, keep, keep it going. Cool. Hmm? Communication styles, uh, I mean, this really varies on the individual PMs. Even in the UK, um, certainly in the UK, you'll find that PMs not necessarily, are not necessarily English of nationality. Uh, they could be from anywhere. And that's simply more reflective of the demographics of peoples in the UK. In China, uh, I, I've never yet come across an English PM working in China. doesn't mean they don't exist, it's just they've not come across one. <laughs> so you, you'd likely be speaking to well, a Chinese person in China, a Chinese person in Taiwan, a Japanese person if you're working with, with Japan. Um, in the UK... Probably an English person, but it could be where I've worked before. You've had uh, uh, Russian, Czech, Chinese, uh, Spanish, Romanian, Polish, PMs. Um, what does that mean in terms of communication style? Hopefully not too much difference. Uh, usually you're going to find somebody's going to say, here's a project, These are the, this is the word count, we need it back by this time, here's your rates, can you do that? Um, and... Of course, in China, they say your guanxi, your mei guanxi, yes, create guanxi, get on the good side of a PM. But do that in the UK as well? It's not just a Chinese thing. <laughs> if you've got a good rapport with a PM that has work in your language pair, and they know you're reliable, that's why I say communication, make sure it's clear, make sure you respond relatively quickly, then they're likely to give you some more work. Um, the only other difference I would say is... If you're working with China, make sure you've got WeChat. Mm -hmm. how, how do you that? Cool. That's a very good question. Uh, so, first of all, if you're wanting to register with an LSP, you'll have noticed I've spoken a lot about minimum qualifications, your experience and whatnot. If you've got a lot of experience, if you've got a uh, LinkedIn page with 57 recommendations, then that adds a bit of credibility. If you're credible, then they'll take a chance. If they take that chance with you, and they get good feedback, because they will ask feedback from the client in some instances, not necessarily all, you start to gain a bit of what I just called rapport, and build that relationship. If, you're, if you've been hired for an interpreting job, for example, and you turn up at 9 in the morning, and you swagger in at 11, they're pretty much guaranteed that that LSP will never use you again, and they won't pay you. 
because that will be written into the contract. The, you'll notice as you go through the contract that you have with an LSP or with an end client, there will be uh, what are called service level agreements. So if you're five minutes late because traffic's really bad, okay, they'll probably forgive you, but don't do it very often. I would always advise getting there a good quarter of an hour before whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing. If it's translation, this is a pain in the ass <laughs> because it happens to project managers all the time. Oh, I was working on it, my computer froze. Oh, I, the computer broke and I've lost it all. Back it up. <laughs> this is why they will often ask you to do it on their TMS and it will save it as you go along. Um, and if, you, if you've already created the report, it's a genuine problem uh, and you get it back to them very, very quick, they may forgive you and give you another chance. If you've never worked with them before and this is the first time it's creating a bad impression, you probably won't be called again. Honestly. The only time you have slightly more leverage is if you have an extremely rare language and the LSP has no choice but to work with you. However, I'm afraid in the language pairs in this room, that ain't the case. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Well, I've got a question. Well, I've got a question from the other guy that has um, some software software. Mm -hmm. Once you get involved in the project, it will be the department. Okay, so um, are you the client in this instance, in the, or the or the linguist? In, cool. Well, again, uh, first of all, these should all be written to the agreement with the end client. So there will always be contracts with with yourself uh, as the interpreter with the end client. Um, so first of all, if the end client signed the contract and they don't turn up, you have you get paid. They still have to pay. <laughs> if they turn up, you don't turn up. You're not getting paid. <laughs> um, in terms of complaints, then any good LSP should have a mechanism for that. And I, IMD, what we do after every um, interpreting assignment is we ask for feedback and we get proactively in touch with both the linguist and the client. And this is extremely important, certainly in a, uh, a legal context, because if... Uh, well, if you, if you get something wrong, someone's going to jail, potentially. Um, and also, certainly in the UK, everybody should be equal opportunities employers. And they should, I'm saying should, because I'm sure some don't, but there should be policies in place, um, A, for whistleblowing, B, for protecting of various rights, uh, and then C, your general, uh, your general contracts as well. Um, if you suspect, before you've taken a job on, that an LSP isn't quite right, ask them. If they don't have a policy on something that's very close to your heart or something that you have a concern about, go to a different LSP. We've got policies in everything. Do you have any more questions for Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about um, getting the specialist area to find any trends in Japanese? Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. Um, make sure you're interested in it. Don't try and find a niche that you're not interested in. This goes back, right back to the, remember where it said disaster? The job that I took was, uh, it was in Shanghai, uh, and it was for a company, it was for a chemical company. Uh, now, my, my father worked for a chemical company. So I thought, ah, following father's footsteps, good idea. Not a good idea. <laughs> I, hate, I hate chemicals. Um, but I've, I've worked and found that out the hard way. And again, uh, I mentioned uh, I took on that, um, that translation that involved chemicals. Of course, I did it to a good standard, but I hated doing it. And I've never done chemicals ever since. I refuse to. It doesn't matter if I can or can't. I don't like it. <laughs> Why would I do something that I don't like? Unless you're going to pay me like a thousand per word, and yeah, I'll force myself to like it for that, but that's never going to happen. 
how to find a niche or a specialism that you like. Well, think. What, what are your hobbies? What do you like doing? What, what sort of books do you like reading or, or TV shows watching? Um, at the beginning, it was mentioned here at Leeds University, there are various different uh, courses related to translation, audiovisual, so including subtitling, interpreting. There's a, a great deal of stuff out of there. Do you need to do a degree to do it? I would encourage it because it will, of course, you learn the skills properly. Um, but if you, we find with lots of linguists, sometimes they try and branch out into it. And this is, again, where I bring it back to you. You need to have experience in it. How to gain experience? Well, um, translation, again, have you heard of translator, Translators Without Borders? Uh, it's a voluntary organization. You can build up a word count and some practice on, on that, for example. Um, China Dialogue. That, uh, I think Elizabeth, uh, Isabel Fulton was the one that set it up. Um, it's on uh, in the environment. So if you're in, interested in the environment, then perhaps get in touch with uh, Isabel. Isabel, by the way, is also a um, member of the advisory board of Chinese Speakers the Org, uh, the Association of Speakers of Chinese Language. <laughs> that long one. Um, so in short, how do you pick a, a specialism or niche? What are you interested in? Medicine is quite difficult. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I mentioned earlier qualifications and whatnot. Yes, you could do a degree in it, but there are also CDP, so you could do bite-sized chunks, uh, and you could take on generalist work in a more of a legal setting. For example, some of the easier things to start with are probably um, T's and C's. They're very formulaic. I mean, I'm not saying go in and say, hey, LSP, I can do this, when you've never done it before. Practice. Practice, of course, makes perfect. Um, and whatever you're wanting to specialize in, make sure you do practice a bit. Um, there are various things out there that you can volunteer for. Certainly at the moment, if you speak Ukrainian, there's lots of stuff you can volunteer for. Um, but otherwise, how do you get into law? If that's what you're wanting to get in, then check out various CDP options through any of these associations, but also the Law Society. Um, make sure you're revising and reading um, things related to whatever it is that you're learning how to do. Um, court judgments, for example. Uh, it could be a court judgment on inf patent infringement for whatever chemical thing it was that I translated all that time ago. Or it could be um, it could be a case uh, a, tra a trademark uh, infringement or anything really. Um, but read them, translate them, try yourself. It's what you guys are all doing here at university, presumably practicing. Should be. Hope you are. Make sure you do your homework. Otherwise, he'll tell you off. Um, but no, look at your interests. What you like read up on it, make sure you still like it, and then practice translating it, and then reach out and say, hey, I did this, here's a portfolio, here's examples of translations I've done before, send me the work. Uh, and that doesn't have to be in legal. Uh, the one thing, the, the one that I would say probably needs a little bit more practice, and a little bit more qualifications would be stuff like uh, medical devices. You don't want to translate the instructions for an endoscope wrong. It would hurt. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Yes. Um, what part is it about saying that I learned textile work? Uh, you know, where I'm coming up with other niches and everywhere actually find that I've learned from other people. Does that mean everything about me has different? Because you can't just translate in one instance. So, this is why I'm suggesting everybody start now while they're at university, try and build up a portfolio, because if you're taking jobs for, from the local community, they usually don't ask you to sign an NDA. Um, if you're doing volunteer work, for example, for Translators Without Borders, um, they're, they're quite happy for you to, to say, hey, you've donated this many words and, and done X, Y, and Z. Um, thirdly, if you're practicing yourself, if you've got something that you've translated, as part of your portfolio, you did that translation. You can use that as an example of what you can do. I mentioned a website called Prose. Uh, it is a bit antiquated now. 
um, but it, it's still active, um, and some of the older ones still use it. Um, <laughs> but it's still a, a platform on which to show you, show your stuff. Um, and on there, there's an option of, of giving a few examples of stuff you've translated. So you've got, obviously, the source and then translation, so somebody can have a look at it. Um, so in short, recommendations on social media adds credibility. Volunteer organizations are good for practice. Start trying to take on work from, perhaps not an LSP, but smaller, smaller companies, and utilize your network. Say, hey, I'm open for business. If anybody's got anything, let me in touch. Does that answer the question? Cool. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, instructions uh, he has shared with us a lot, a lot of knowledge, uh, new cyber knowledge, I would say, about the American cyber industry, uh, about uh, the uh, legal, uh, especially the use uh, of legal translation to the industry, and a lot of useful insights and a lot of practical suggestions and tips. Uh, and here we have to uh, benefit uh, from, from this report. Great report. Uh, thank you so much, James. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's the end of the